Okay, so we are getting uh, into Justice League, the Justice Doom War. And initially I thought doing this video, like doing the, this story arc as a singular story arc unto itself, but for a lot of people who are reading uh, either Year of the Villain or just the, the, the Justice League events itself, or at least getting caught up, it can all be really confusing, right? In terms of like Perpetua and the multiverse and you know, all these forces and everything that are going on. And so the cool thing about this is that while other writers like Joshua Williamson is writing The Flash and he's using like, you know, there, there's kind of the, the induction of these other forces, you know, the still force and, and Sage Force and so on and so forth. We're going to kind of ignore that. Not in so far as it's not in, in continuity or not in existence. I mean, it is, but we're going to kind of ignore what's going on there and we're going to focus strictly on what's happening here because what Scott Snyder really does is essentially explain it all. And the reality of this is, is kind of the question why did DC wait so long? And this really kind of reveals it in terms of, of the events going on here. But the cool thing about it is that this really picks up with the idea of, between the, the Justice League and the, the Legion of Doom going to war against each other. And in reality, that's how it is that the events of Year of the Villain are set up, right? Like, you're the villain is interesting insofar as as like you know the offer of Lex Luthor right basically like he travels around from place to place to various villains essentially and offers them you know makes the offer like do they want to join his Legion of Doom the Joker turned it down and and a lot of them, a lot of them have turned it down but a lot of them have also accepted it too and so as a result of that it's basically you know the 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 offer set of events or the offer storyline in DC is really more just like backup features like one page you know or two page parts at the end of a story where where Lex Luthor is basically building up his own Legion of Doom that's really all it is. And in reality, I wouldn't have called it like Year of the Villain. I would have just called it like the Rise of the Legion of Doom or something like that, you know, and, and it just would have tied into and made a lot more sense in terms of like, if only, you know, only because of its namesake. But at the very least here, with Lex Luthor forming his own Legion of Doom for the purpose of basically serving Perpetua and then the, the Justice League standing against him, that's kind of where things are at the moment. So what this does is it actually picks up seemingly like with the battle, with the war seemingly over, right? Like the, the Legion of Doom having basically won. And what's cool about this is we get this depiction of Lex Luthor who basically uses all all these forces at his disposal, right? Like the Still Force, the Ultraviolet Lantern Force. Those of you guys who are unfamiliar, remember, the Ultraviolet Lanterns are basically lanterns who can bring out essentially the worst in people, right? Like all their raw negative emotions are all kind of brought to the surface. Unlike most of the other Lantern Cores that, that really get their power from a central power battery, the Ultraviolet Lantern Core is basically fed by Umbrax, this being that existed outside the Source Wall, and then once the Source Wall was broken, made its way into the main DC universe. Again, we've got a video on like what the Ultraviolet Lanterns are, so you'll find that down in the description if you want a more nuanced and a more detailed explanation there. But the long and short of it is that everything that's going on right now, that is to say Lex Luthor basically killing all the members of the Justice League, basically destroying any opposition that he has, is really more of a, a vision of sorts that's given to them by Will Payton, by Starman, right? And this is important because what it does is it basically shows the Justice League, this is what you guys are going to be dealing with. <laughs> this is what you guys are going to be coping with at the moment. This is how bad things are popping off. And so with the way this plays out, it's really interesting. The way this plays out is Will Payton basically says like, like in order to, to essentially pull this off if we face off against Lex Luthor as he stands now we'll lose just because of the fact that his his the, the fraction of the totality the device that basically allowed him to essentially bring back Perpetua and in turn allows to, to seemingly channel some of his energy or at least most of his energy is much bigger than Will Payton's basically so essentially like he can tap into more of that power than Will Payton can and so the argument is we need to go to like two different points in time outside of the present day in order to access these various you know remainders of the of the totality remember this is an artifact that when it came flying through in and landed on Earth in the main DC universe, it also breached the barriers of space and time just because of the fact that space and time are synonymous. You can't have one without the other. And so it had basically left fractions of itself throughout the time stream and the two big fractions they need would equal a power or seem to rival the power of Lex Luthor and give them a fighting chance. And so because of that, what the Justice League ends up doing is basically bringing together the entirety of its team, right? Like the whole totality of its team. You've got Shazam here. You've got like, like Black Canary. You've got Supergirl. You've got all these various characters here, um, all of whom are, are essentially like fighting on behalf of the Justice League and trying to see this mission come to its fruition. Now, this is where the explanation begins to come into play. And this is why it matters so much is because what we end up finding out here from Will Payton, the way this plays out is that at some point or another, Perpetua was basically created by what was called the Source, right? And the Source is one of these things that DC's never fully bothered to like go on and explain in its entirety. If you go back and you read the old Jack Kirby comics, right? The old Fourth World comics and things like that. The Source is basically God, but then you go into like the Vertigo line Line, and then like God is there, like like it's called the presence, right? So like God actually exists. For the most part, DC's kind of treated it insofar as the source is essentially God to a degree. And then like God has different aspects, right? So like God's judgment comes in the form of, uh, of the specter, different things like that. DC really treats their kind of source of creation as a little more ambiguous. Regardless of the circumstance, the idea behind this was that the source essentially created
created uh, Perpetua alongside of a host of other individuals that would go forward and essentially create like universes and multiverses, right? They would create life. So very celestial-esque from Marvel Comics in terms of their form and function. The difference is that unlike uh, unlike the, the individuals that she fought beside, or at least kind of existed beside, Perpetua wanted to bring down the various, you know, I guess parents, for lack of a better word. And this essentially led to her creating like what, what, what would eventually become humans and Martians, right? In the sense that as Lex Luthor exists, uh, exists now, he's what Perpetua originally created. And then in turn, they basically split off as time went on, then you got humans and you got Martians. Uh, as a result of that, Lex Luthor is kind of the first step in a return to the, the various kind of source of beings that Perpetua created. Ultimately, this led to a kind of civil war of sorts where you had Perpetua facing off against uh, the Monitor, the Anti-Monitor, and the Forger of Worlds, and they in turn imprisoned her behind the Source Wall. Because of that, with the new multiverse basically being created as it exists now, kind of wiping away what she did, and then the, the Monitor, Anti-Monitor, and the, the Forger of Worlds creating like a new multiverse, this basically leads to things as they exist at the moment. So that's why you have the Speed Force, you've got the Emotional Spectrum as it exists, the various Lantern Cores that exist out there, everything outside of the Ultraviolet Lanterns, basically. Uh, you've got the Sphere of Gods, and presumably the Rock of Eternity, and all that kind of good stuff. What, what Will Payton basically says is on the other side of that coin are basically all the, the, the seven hidden energies of creation as they were used by Perpetua. Basically what she created when she created her, her dark multiverse, basically. Like her evil version of the multiverse, more or less. And that's when you start getting into, into all the various forces that are kind of coming into fruition now, right? Like the Still Force, the Sage Force, all that kind of good stuff. Those are all the things that Lex Luthor can essentially tap into if he's able to harness like the full totality of what he can do. And that's why when you looked at the beginning of the story, the Justice League was utterly destroyed because they never really had a chance to face off against such a sheer level of power. And so with that being the case, what you've basically got here is you have a, a, a shard of the totality in the past, which the Justice League has to get, and then a shard of the totality in the future, which the Justice League has to get, and then bring them all together in the present day, and then presumably they'll, they'll stand a fighting chance. And so it's a, it's a cool little moment here, like when you get this, this explanation in terms of how it all works, which in reality, having like that condensed and, and uh, concise explanation is kind of long overdue, right? Like having a whole one-shot comic that explains it but doesn't in a murky way is okay, but at the end of the day, like, you know, especially me, I do much better when I have like a clear and concise short explanation on something, so I don't have to like hunt all over the place or try to decipher clues or different things like that. It's interesting, it kind of depends on the story. Uh, but the long and short of this is that with Lex Luthor's Legion of Doom fully assembled, the other half of this is they also know what the Justice League is doing. And the reason why is it really comes out of the issue before this, which isn't super important. I mean, it is important insofar as like what you learned from it, but basically Jaro had kind of taken over the, the Justice League to a degree. Nothing anything insane, it wasn't like nefarious or anything like that, but Jaro is a small piece of Starro. And Starro had been destroyed at one point, but is basically regrowing under the control of Lex Luthor. And so because Starro is regrowing, he's able to reach out into his smaller little tidbits there, uh, here and there, which comes in the form of Jaro. And because Jaro had taken over the minds of the Justice League, it means that Jaro read their minds, and in turn, Starro now knows everything the Justice League is going to do. So essentially, this battle's done before it's won. And it's kind of a, it's a, it's a cool little moment there, because what it does is it creates a branch, right? It creates the ability for the, the Legion of Doom to essentially use Starro as a means to spy on his Jaro counterpart and then watch the Justice League all the time. So this whole discussion that they've had, this whole plan they've that they've put together, you know, with the help of Will Payton, is all now known by the Legion of Doom. And so it's basically like, okay, so like they're seemingly screwed. <laughs> they're basically screwed. Like there's really not much they can do. At the same time, they've also got a saboteur in their ranks that when the portals are created that allow them to enter into the time stream, it's basically sabotage. They don't end up exactly where they're supposed to, or at least it doesn't seem to be the case, right? You end up picking up with John Stewart and you pick up with the Flash, both of whom are, you know, arrive in the past, but they don't arrive in the past as it's supposed to exist right now. They arrive in the past as if it's already been conquered by Perpetua and all of her various forces, right? So it's one of these, these weird little scenarios because hypertime in DC is, uh, is really like an overcomplicated mess. It was the attempt of DC to basically keep what they did after Crisis on Infinite Earths, right? Before Crisis on Infinite Earths, you had a multiverse. You had multiple realities, each one having its own version of the Justice League or, or any number of combinations, right? Having no Justice League at all, having just like a series of heroes here and there and different things like that. When Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, DC eliminated all of that, right? They said, okay, there's only one universe. The issue is that it limited the heck out of their ability to write stories, right? Like, how do you write stories that are interesting where they go to a far-flung future or they go to some scenario where things played out differently and, and so on and so forth? And so what ended up happening is with Mark Wade and a couple others, DC invented hypertime. And hypertime, if you can imagine it in your head, is one of these points where if you start from point A and you go to point B, uh, if you look at it as a single timeline, it's just point A to point B. It's a straight line. That's basically it. With hypertime, what you get is point A and then you curve up and come down to point B. And that curve is like some alternate reality where the flash killed everybody. And then you've got one where it curves down from point A to point B. And that curve is an alternate reality.
reality where Superman killed everybody. It's a way for DC to basically say there's alternate timelines and they all branch off from a singular point in time, but they all coalesce and basically arrive in a guaranteed future. They're there, but it's like they're not there, right? I mean, it's, it's like one of those things where no matter what you do, you can't change it, essentially. There's no way to undo that timeline. It's, I think it's kind of murky and I think it's a mess and I think it's unnecessary and I think it's overcomplicated in reality. Uh, either pick alternate realities and just go with the Marvel formula or don't, right? It's just Marvel's formula for alternate realities is infinitely easy to understand, right? Like branch universe theory. If it exists, there exists an alternate reality for it and that alternate reality exists because something in the main Marvel universe happened that caused it. But regardless of the situation, you also end up picking up with Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman who of course are sent into this future and in turn, like when they arrive there, the totality's conquered everything and of course they're rescued by Kid Commandy. Now, the character of Commandy, uh, I guess Commandy, I mean Commandy, I'm not really, you know, I, I call it Commandy. Maybe it's Commandy. I'm not 100% sure how you pronounce it. But he basically comes from an old school comic that was actually self titled, Commandy, uh, Commandy the, the Ongoing Series, which was launched in 1972. Um, technically, it was called Commandy the Last Boy on Earth. And the way this played out was that in this alternate reality, which I think was designated Earth 86, I'm not going to swear to that. I want to say there's two different iterations there's Earth 86 and Earth 295. But basically, the, the long and short of it was that after this natural disaster, uh, especially when it came to like radiation, the, the fallout of, of nuclear war. This essentially permeated a handful of animals, both being experimented on uh, by a particular doctor, as well as whatever animals were left around the environment. And over the course of time, they became anthropomorphic. So think Planet of the Apes, except more than just apes. And in turn, these this this basically led to Commandy being the last boy who was left on Earth, the last human being of sorts. What Scott Snyder really seems to be doing here, which I'm not avidly against it, is taking the concept of Commandy and then just rolling it in right now and just kind of saying, okay, here's a more updated depiction of the character. He hails from a universe where the great cataclysm, the great, you know, disaster that was prophesized by the people who inhabited Earth at the time before it all took place was actually the arrival of Perpetua and essentially the recreation of the multiverse, right? We can just kind of go with that and take it as an explanation. It works. Commandy's obscure enough where, where Scott Snyder can really kind of do what he wants with him and then just sort of call it a day. Uh, most people have probably never heard of him, right? Never heard of the character or anything along those lines. But the fact remains that when it comes to this, the arrival of the League here and basically being saved by these animal men essentially indicates that there is some measure of resistance against the forces of Perpetua and Lex Luthor and so on and so forth, which kind of makes sense, right? I mean, it'd be somewhat bleak and really hopeless if it turned out to be like a forever, I'm sorry, a, a future, uh, what was what was that? Um, um, I keep wanting to say future imperfect, but that's not right. It's not, it's not called future imperfect. What is it called? Oh my God, Gordon, do not delete this segment. Like people have to understand how my brain works and me trying to figure these things out because I feel like there's fans right now who are screaming the name into their monitors. <laughs> And, and or screaming the name into their phones or whatever. And I'm just sitting here like struggling. Um, it's not Future's End. I think it is Future's End. I think that's what it's called. I can't remember. Uh, I got a little bit into it and I was like, this is garbage and then closed it. <laughs> <laughs> which I imagine most people won't disagree with. They'll just kind of be like, yeah, you were kind of right to make that call. That story's pretty bad. Uh, but it'd be, it'd be different if it was something bleak like that, right? Where like everybody's screwed basically. Uh, but to have a kind of resistance force basically means that like there's still remnants out there. There's still factions out there. And if it's Commandy and the Animal Men, well then there could be various other individuals out there. Now, it could also just be like Scott Snyder using this as a way to just kind of springboard a, a new Commandy series, you know, and just kind of like, we're going to talk about Commandy now. And, and whether or not that that's popular kind of remains to be seen but here's the big takeaway from this all right here's the big here's the big thing for all this and then when i saw this it like i almost popped it was insane like i got i got to this and i was just like i was like holy cow right so like you pick up with with john stewart and with the flash and with this this future they're looking at you know in this this landscape so obviously we're talking about two different futures but with this future that they're looking at in this landscape like everything seems to be just like totally you know kind of collapsed and what's left of civilization is living in like huts and these little makeshift buildings and different things like that and suddenly they're met by the arrival like they, they have like this giant green ring that circles around them and it's just like okay so like what in the world is going on and my first thought when i saw this is i was like okay cool like other guys who are going to be against who are going to be against like perpetua and lex and all them and whatever this multiverse is or they're just kind of existing in this universe whatever this universe happens to be i'm kind of curious who these guys are going to be i turned the page it said it was the justice society of america and i was like what in the hell like i was oh, dude man let me tell you something dude i was oh, dude my mind was blown i was like dude this is bonkers man dude the, the jsa and here's the thing it's the whole JSA, right? Like Sandman, Johnny Thunder, like Jay Garrick, uh, Alan Scott, Dr. Fate. I was, I was, dude, Hawkman. I was like, dude, what in the world is going on? That guy who's like the Panther looking guy that I never cared enough to learn about. Like, dude, it's, it's crazy to see that. I was like, dude, this is, this is nuts, man. So like the JSA is not really back insofar as they're back in the main DC universe. I think that's confined to Jeff Johns, but we get to see the JSA, man. Who cares how they appear, man? These dudes could all be wearing underpants and I'd be like, JSA, son. Let's get to it. Dude, I'd be hyped. <laughs> 
Okay, so we are finally getting back into the Justice Doom War by Scott Snyder. We are getting into part two, part dos. And this is gonna be kind of a big one here, right? There's a lot going on, but as a bit of a refresher for people who are unfamiliar, right? Because it took us a little while to kind of get back into this. What you basically have here, the kind of big overarching thing is the return of Perpetua. And the reason why we say the return is because Perpetua was the one who created the multiverse, right? This, at least this particular multiverse in DC Comics. And the idea was that she was essentially not really governed by so much as ruled over over or assisted by these kind of apex predator soldiers. Now, eventually she was defeated by the combined forces of the Monitor, the Anti-Monitor, and the Forger of Worlds. And so following her defeat and her imprisonment within the Source Wall, it then turned to the Monitor, the Anti-Monitor, and the Forger of Worlds to begin creating kind of like a new multiverse that basically, you know, ended up in its current form as it exists now. And of course, included things like, you know, Infinite Crisis, Final Crisis, Crisis on Infinite Earths, different things like that. But the idea was that Perpetua has basically been released by, uh, by Lex Luthor, and and Lex Luthor is kind of reverted back into one of her apex predators, right? Now, the way this played out was originally these predators were ultimately split, right? One, one part of them kind of became humans. The other part became Martians. And so with Lex Luthor absorbing Martian Manhunter, that's how we kind of reverted back into this sort of apex version of a character or these kind of soldiers that were used by Perpetua in order to rule the universe or rule the multiverse. And her, her vision of the multiverse is a dark place, right? It's a very dark and very harsh environment. And so in order to keep this, this victory from happening by the Legion of Doom, what ended up happening is the, the Justice League was really split into two parts. One part basically went into the past, the other part went into the present, and then another part basically stayed into a uh, state in the present day. But the idea is that they're essentially traveling throughout the entire time stream to find these, these artifacts, these pieces of the totality, which can be assembled and be used, which is their only real chance of defeating Perpetua because of the fact that it has so much incredible power. And so the, the version of the Justice League that went into the past, including the Flash, Green Lantern, Jon Stewart, and so on, ended up running into the Justice Justice Society of America, and that's where this picks up. Now, here's the important thing to understand here, and here's kind of the interesting thing about this, is a lot of this is being viewed by Brainiac, right? Brainiac, uh, Brainiac's basically kind of continuing along the path of bottling up cities, different things like that, but we don't really know exactly what his role is in all this, insofar as, you know, outside of being part of the Legion of Doom and bottling up worlds, and ensuring the Justice League can't find the, the totality and the various aspects of the time stream, it basically leads to, like, the JSA and, and this version of the Justice League encountering each other, but they've never met, and they don't know who the other is. And this is kind of an important thing, right? Because one part of this really kind of leads into the idea of Doomsday Clock, which is to say the fact that 10 years from these heroes' me uh, memories were basically missing. But the other part of this is that technically the JSA doesn't exist in DC. And the reason why is because if you guys remember from Doomsday Clock, the JSA was formed by Green Lantern Alan Scott. But because of the fact that Dr. Manhattan had basically intervened and Alan Scott died before he could attain his Green Lantern, the JSA was never formed. And so there was no indication that characters like Jay Garrick or any of those guys ever existed. Now, Doomsday Clock will likely rectify all of that when the final issue comes out, but as it stands at the moment, Barry does not know who Jay Garrick is, and Jay Garrick does not know who Barry is. Now, this is a particularly interesting continuity error considering the fact that Barry Allen, during the events of The Button, knew who Jay Garrick was, right? So that's why things are kind of finicky here. That's why things are kind of funny. It's a little strange in terms of how it all comes together. This is likely just a massive continuity error by DC. But the cool thing about this is that for people who were fans of the JSA, you get to see them in spectacular fashion, right? You get to see Jay Garrick, you get to see Alan Scott really being the kind of heroes that they were. Now, in terms of, of why they're in this particular point in time, why they're in this era, we don't know explicitly when this time period takes place. We simply just know that it's in the past. But before we get into that, what we're going to do is we're we're going to switch over to Commandy, basically the, the last human being alive on Earth in this future where you have Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and so on, and animals have really kind of risen up. Now, of course, we covered how all this transpired in the first video, so you're welcome to go check that out to kind of get the origin of how this uh, future ended up the way that it was. But of course, they're immediately set upon by all these members of these Brainiac robots and so on and so forth, these kind of police force or what have you. But essentially what you end up getting here is basically them tracking down and trying to locate the Hall of Justice. And it's kind of a cool little thing here because once they're able to locate that uh, locate the Hall of Justice itself. And once you're able to kind of initiate their plan, ultimately it allows them to actually leave this universe and start traveling to the other universes that Brainiac has at his disposal. And the reason why is because the totality could be in any one of those. And that's what really makes the situation so hairy is because what they're looking for is essentially a needle in a stack of needles, right? I mean, they, they literally have to go through every single one of these universes that, that Brainiac has and try to find the totality in each one, right? So it's going to be kind of a kind of a crazy thing because totality is only in one of them, right? 
right? And that's where things kind of get crazy and kind of get bonkers is because ultimately they have to use this kind of beacon of sorts to try to locate it, but it'd be insanely difficult to find. Now, of course, at the same time, you've got the present day Justice League, which is to say the Forger of Worlds and the Monitor alongside a uh, hot girl and so on who basically go into bleed space, right? Because their idea is to locate the anti-monitor. Now, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with bleed space, the bleed itself in DC is essentially the space between universes, right? So it's like if I took a whole bunch of golf balls and I put them in a sink of water, all that water represents the bleed, right? The space between the different universes and each one of those golf balls is a universe itself, right? So that's really all that is. Now, normally you're, you're talking about an extremely dangerous place to try to navigate through, right? I mean, you can't take any any kind of technologically advanced vessel from, from DC or from the main DC universe and just fly into bleed space and be fine. It would probably tear it to pieces, right? That's the reason why you have the, uh, the Multiversal Justice League, for example, which uses a specialized ship in order to do it. And this particular vessel has been retrofitted by the Forger of Worlds and the Monitor in order to try to try to maintain and sustain itself while they're traveling through the bleed, but there's no guarantee. But the cool thing about this, and this is kind of kind of an interesting takeaway from this, is that what you end up getting is basically this, this kind of recollection, or at least this, this instance whereby when Superman and his forces travel from one of the universes of Brainiac into another, they essentially end up encountering a group that, that really refers to themselves as the Justice Legion A. Now, Justice Legion A also stands for Justice Legion Alpha, and longtime DC fans will immediately recognize this group because this is the version of the Justice League from DC 1 million. And that's kind of the dangerous thing about this because what it shows is that as part of the Legion, part of the Legion of Doom from Lex Luthor, what Brainiac has been doing is running all throughout the time stream and basically capturing all these different universes or all these little portions of a universe from all throughout the time stream, right? From the very, very distant past all the way up to the distant future. And so that's what makes things so crazy. And that's why they have to jump from one container basically to the next, trying to find the totality where wherever it may be among all these different universes. It's an insane kind of goal to have to achieve, but the Justice Legion Alpha is an exceedingly powerful team, right? Because in the DC 1 million landscape, the Justice League really evolved beyond its role of being a protector of the world. And instead it evolved out to become a protector of the galaxy. And so Justice Legion Alpha has its base of operations on Jupiter and they're charged with protecting the solar system, right? So basically what you're getting here is the, the DC 1 million team, which is kind of cool to see them return here. At the same time, and I don't know how I really feel about this, we basically end up finding out that the, this, uh, this particular group of the Justice Society of America, of course, it's operating in 1945 during World War II, and the Legion of Doom forces who have made their way into the past really kind of try to cut off this superhero team are basically piloting Japanese uh, planes in order to attack Pearl Harbor, which is kind of a, it's, it's kind of a crappy thing to do, I think. <laughs> kind of weird, kind of strange. But the reason why you have the JSA during 1945 is because when you had the JSA originally in DC, uh, they were basically like an Earth One, an alternate reality team, right? I mean, originally they were World War II characters, but when DC created the multiverse, they basically said, okay, so essentially like all the superheroes or all, I guess the version of the Justice League that Jay Garrick was a part of on Earth 2 and this new Justice League is on Earth 1. That's basically it. When you got to Crisis on Infinite Earths, the entire multiverse was wiped away and the JSA went with it, right? Because if there was no alternate reality, there'd be no basis for the JSA to exist. But it did have a huge fan base. And so what DC did is they came back with the reintroduction of the JSA. And what they said was that the JSA fought during World War II. They were basically superheroes who existed during the 1940s and 1950s. And so by the time Superman rose to prominence, by the time Clark Kent moved to Metropolis and became Superman, by the time that, that, that Bruce Wayne's parents were murdered, he went and trained and then came back to Gotham and became Batman. By the time all these modern era superheroes rose to prominence, the JSA had been retired. And so when, when you got to the events before the new 52 in 2011, the JSA was basically a bunch of retired superheroes who came out of retirement and back into active superheroing again. And that's how you got those teams unified together. It's why you see them here during World War II. Uh, this is really kind of a kind of a bookend way, I think, for Scott Snyder to kind of bring the JSA back and to say, well, this is probably how they're going to return. Yes, they were there during World War II and what's likely going on here during Doomsday Clock, especially when we saw like Johnny Thunder and characters like that who were originally part of the JSA is their minds were wiped. They don't know who they are. Characters like Jay Garrick were removed and thrown into the Speed Force and all the other members of the JSA don't know who they are, right? Alan Scott's dead. Johnny Thunder is stuck in an insane asylum. Everybody thinks he's crazy when he's saying that like he's got crazy powers and so on and so forth. Jay Garrick's in the Speed Force and any other members of the JSA had likely had their memories wiped by Manhattan, which is why they're not active anymore, right? So, I mean, there's there's all kinds of little things that can go into it, little tidbits here and there. They can really kind of clear all this up. But what it does is it basically shows us kind of going into this, this tale a little bit here. It shows us that essentially Aquaman is working on behalf of the Anti-Monitor. That during the, the story where Aquaman was supposed to have died, the Drowned Earth event, where Aquaman was supposed to have been removed and killed off, that what the Anti-Monitor did was essentially save him and then turn him into a henchman for himself. Now, the reason why that's the case actually 
becomes prominent here in a minute. And the reason why, and this is particularly important, is because there's a, com a conversation that takes place between Wonder Woman and Kamandi. Basically, what ends up going on here is that in this future, this DC 1 million future, that the Justice League temporarily faces off against the Justice Legion A. It's not a great big, huge knockdown, drag out fight. Instead, they're basically fighting these kind of these these other forces out there and ultimately end up defeating them. But there's this conversation Wonder Woman has in the sense that Kamandi comes from an age when war is all they really know, right? Like war is what brought the downfall of society, but the world that he lives in is harsh and it's really kind of not really every man for himself so much as survive by whatever means you can and so as a result of that where, where Kamandi comes from a civil from a from a, a, a future where you do have little civilizations there and little pockets of, of groups and things like that where people do work together for the most part he's used to a very harsh environment and so when he looks back on the recollection or at least on these these stories of old right you know the world being plunged into war and things like that his perception of the past is that all humanity did was engage in war and so when he met the Justice League and they basically showed him that hey it's not not all just about warfare there's things like compassion things like hope and that's what warfare is predicated on we fight these fights because we want to ensure that people who are innocent don't really end up getting caught in these things but also because by defeating these bad guys there's hope for a better tomorrow it really kind of seems to instill in the idea of Kamani to simply not just run away this idea that he's really kind of the only hope they have in so far as he'll do what needs to be done in order to help try to save the day and so ultimately what ends up happening is one of the members of the Justice Legion is housing the totality itself and so because because of the fact that the intention, once Brainiac 1 million reveals himself, where the intention is to use this power to essentially take out the Justice Legion as well as the Justice League of America, incapacitate them, most likely force them into subservience by turning them into his, his soldiers or what have you, that the totality is taken by Wonder Woman and given to Commandy, and then basically Commandy is sent out in order to ensure the survival of the totality. That's exceedingly important. But what we end up doing is jumping back to the past and probably one of the coolest things, because where this whole battle is raging during, uh, during World War II, you know, with regards to the attack on Pearl Harbor, all these soldiers, right, when the USS Arizona is hit by a torpedo and, and sunk, were under normal circumstances and in real world history, a litany of soldiers died during that, that whole, uh, that whole scenario. Instead, Aquaman comes to the rescue with a Kraken. <laughs> And it's one of the coolest things, right? To see him just like pop up with this enormous Kraken. But it's kind of a funny thing because what he does is he tells them like, look, I get you guys are here to get the totality and that's cool and everything, but you can't succeed, right? You, there's no way you guys can win here. It's not really possible. And so it's kind of a funny thing here because when, when you get this whole thing unfolding, it's like, okay, so like all fingers and all scenarios are pointing to the idea that what the Justice League is doing is that while they're trying their best, there's nothing they really can do. There's nothing they can do to win because the power of Perpetua is growing every second of every day. And it's getting to the point where it's basically uncontainable, right? Where, where it can't be stopped. And so what you end up having is Perpetua, who basically travels with Lex, uh, Lex Luthor directly to the very edge of all things in existence and ultimately meets with the Anti-Monitor. And the question is, which side does the Anti-Monitor choose? And it's kind of a cool thing here because you would look at the Anti-Monitor as a character and you would say, okay, so it's always been a villain, right? The Anti-Monitor has, has led to the destruction of the multiverse in the first Crisis on Infinite Earths event. And then while it didn't really reappear in the traditional sense until Dark Side War, as far as it actually being a being that exists out there, the events of Dark Side War, the events that led up to it, like Forever Evil, saw, saw the Anti-Monitor traveling from one universe to the next and continuing to wipe it out, right? So he's always kind of been this force of nature, almost Galactus to a degree, but with a little more hint of evil in him. But when you have this scenario unfold, ultimately the Anti-Monitor ends up siding with the Forger of Worlds, the Monitor, and the Earth's superheroes. And so what this shows is that essentially everybody has it out for Perpetua, right? Like everybody's against Perpetua here. But it's kind of a cool scenario because the way that, that, that Scott Snyder plays this out is okay but like they can't really win anyway and it doesn't really even matter and this is really kind of really kind of comes to a head when you end up having the forger of worlds who goes to attack perpetua and nothing happens and it's kind of a cool little moment because what ends up happening is of course they basically end up merging into the ultra monitor basically this gigantic monitor unto itself like this single ultra powerful being that was one of the forces or really kind of the the total force that ended up defeating perpetua in the first place but all indications seem to point to the idea that perpetua's power is either at or a little bit higher than it was when they originally fought. And so she can't really be defeated in the traditional sense. Instead, it's going to require more ability than what was originally had in order to see her defeated. And so jumping back to the past with regards to the Justice League fighting alongside the JSA, their journey to find the totality after essentially stopping the Legion of Doom to a degree with regards to the attack on Pearl Harbor is that while the Legion of Doom appears to be incapacitated, their journey ends up taking them to Atlantis. And of course, this kind of coincides with the time in which Atlantis's king is basically missing. And so ultimately, the Legion of Doom makes their move only to reveal 
that they've captured Poseidon. Now, it's kind of a funny thing here because when that happens at the same time that takes place, you end up getting Vandal Savage and his Legionnaires Club. Now, Vandal Savage and Legionnaires Club is a group that we've seen in the early stories of Scott Snyder's run on Justice League that were after the totality and managed to capture a portion of it. And so what this looks like, and I'm not going to swear to this as an absolute truth, but what this looks like is the absolute past of the DC universe. This is actually the past, right? So basically they've, they've gone into 1945 in the past of the main DC universe, meaning the Justice Society of America existed during that point in time, which begs the question, why don't they exist now? Again, tying back into the events of Doomsday Clock. It's a cool little bit of a revelation here, but where you have the, uh, where you have Brainiac 1 million, who's basically going off against the, the Justice League, the Justice League doesn't really seem to be able to defeat it just because of the fact that Brainiac 1 million is so incredibly powerful, where you've got the Justice League in the present day who aren't really able to do anything to stop Perpetua, and then you've got the Legionnaires Club basically showing up in the past. It all really points to the idea that capturing totalities, even if they can do it, won't fix everything, but it doesn't look like they can. It does not look like they can actually capture the pieces of the totality and save everything. And so what it does is it all falls down on the shoulders of Kamandi. And Kamandi begins addressing basically this, this particular group out there, this unseen, you know, group out there and says like, we need more people here, right? Like we need more help. The Justice League as it exists now is not powerful enough on their own. We need more forces here. And that's what we end up finding out that Commandy is not just talking to anybody. Commandy is actually talking to the Justice League Unlimited group, talking to like Batman Unlimited, Superman Unlimited, all these characters. DC's taking the Unlimited Universe, or at least Scott Snyder is, and rolling it into the Justice League comics. This is amazing. Okay, so we are continuing on with our coverage of the Justice League. And of course, those of you guys who remember what we've talked about in the last couple videos, you basically have the, the Justice League split into a couple different factions. Right? One went into the future, which I don't know why I called the, called the Justice League Beyond team, the Justice League Unlimited team. I was excited. <laughs> Usually when I get excited, I just say things, you know, and, and, and then like stuff comes out and the video goes out and there's, and then people who are like always looking through my videos, trying to find mistakes are like the first ones to find it. You also had a Justice League team that went into the past and encountered the JSA. Now I want to clear the air on this, on the Justice Society of America, as it appears in Justice League and the JSA, as it appears in Doomsday Clock, right? Because until we got to the ending of Doomsday Clock, we didn't really know how the JSA fit in anything. And even then, even now that we have an explanation, you still run into a pretty big continuity error uh, with regards to what happened in that story. Story. But uh, the way this the way this plays out, given the way the Doomsday Clock number 12 ended, the way that this played out, you know, kind of making sense of all this is that Dr. Manhattan, as all of you guys know, had moved the lantern out of the way of Alan Scott, right? So Alan Scott never discovered the Green Lantern. Uh, the result was that he was killed in the train crash and then never went on to become, or never went on to become the Green Lantern that we know, and then never formed the Justice Society of America. And that was Jeff Johns explaining why the JSA never existed throughout all the New 52 and the beginning of DC Rebirth. Uh, at the end of Doomsday Clock, Dr. Manhattan put the lantern back. And so because the lantern went back to where it was supposed to be where Alan Scott went on to discover it and then became the Green Lantern. He ended up saving the train from the crash and then, you know, became the superhero that we know and then ultimately went on to form the Justice Society of America. And that's how the team appears at the end of, uh, in the, at the end of Doomsday Clock. Because by altering the past, essentially, which is what Dr. Manhattan did, what it basically meant is that it, it kind of created this cascading effect, right? It altered the timeline in such a way to where the JSA had been there when they were supposed to be there, right? So essentially, this is true. What you're seeing here with issue number 31 in the Justice League, that's how it is. After Dr. Manhattan, Manhattan went back and changed the time stream. The issue that you run into here with this continuity error is that when you have that, when you have that issue where you had uh, Barry Allen and John Stewart talking to Alan Scott and, and Jay Garrick of the JSA, Barry Allen told Jay Garrick, he's like, tell us who you are. And Jay Garrick's like, well, we're the superheroes of the 1940s. We're the Justice Society of America. Who are you guys? And, and Barry Allen's like, well, we're the Justice League, you know? So the fact that the two groups didn't know each other is, is kind of an issue, but only on one side, right? The JSA as Snyder established, you know, where that particular segment took place in the past of the main DC universe. So it makes sense the JSA would not know who the Justice League are because the Justice League went around them. If the JSA are there, it means it takes place after the events of Doomsday Clock, meaning the JSA had always been there. And the JSA, if the JSA had always been there, then it means that the JSA, you know, the, the memories of the Justice League haven't been wiped, which is to say the fact that they didn't know who the JSA was because the JSA was never there, those memories should have been restored, right? The timeline would have corrected itself. The JSA was always there. The Justice League would have remembered them because they would have, you know, read about their stories or whatever the case was. And the result was that the Justice League, Barry Allen, you know, John Stewart, those guys should have known who the JSA were. The fact that they didn't is a continuity error. It only means well, either that or it means that Doomsday Clock, the conclusion of Doomsday Clock, takes place sometime in the middle of, of Scott Snyder's Justice League, which is kind of a hard sell given how much happens in such a short amount of time. It would mean that in the middle of all of Scott Snyder's Justice League, the entirety of Doomsday Clock takes place. And I'd have a hard time believing that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't really believe that. So again, you kind of run into a continuity error there, but hopefully this, this wraps things up and this makes sense. You know, Scott Snyder did an interview with Newsarama where he said the JSA, as it appears in his Justice League comic, is when the team first forms, right? So again, like maybe it was a year or so after the team came together, which explains why they don't, they don't, you know, they're pretty new and, and pretty fresh. But I've seen a few of those questions floating around in terms of how everything gets reconciled. And that's basically how all that works. But nonetheless, you know, with this JSA team being there alongside the Justice League, of course, we talked about how Vandal Savage had shown up. Now, Vandal Savage and the, the Legionnaires Club, as he had formed it, was basically a result of Vandal Savage trying to track down the uh, the the totality fragment. Now, this goes all the way back to Justice League number one, and I think number seven, uh, where it basically gave us like a new origin of, of Vandal Savage and all that kind of stuff, and his efforts to get the, get the piece of the totality. What ends up happening from what we've seen with regards to, to Vandal Savage is that ultimately his fraction of the totality, if you guys remember all the way back in the early run of Snyder, is that ultimately it's taken by, uh, by Lex Luthor, and Lex Luthor kills Vandal Savage. That hasn't happened yet because they've gone back before that took place in the story, but that's what John Stewart warns him of. Like, hey, what you're doing here, it's going to get you killed. Eventually, Lex Luthor is going to kill you. So basically, you need to help us to keep yourself from being killed, right? And because Vandal Savage cherishes life over, over death, <laughs> he basically ends up siding with the Justice League. But what it does is it allows them a way to basically jump back, you know, to, to kind of open a portal that will let them get back to, uh, to their current time. And so at the same time, what you also have is in the future, which is probably one of the coolest parts of the story, in the future, you have, you know, in, in at least the future of Metropolis, you have the Justice League that was sent there, right? So Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, who were all, of course, captured by uh, by Brainiac 1 million. And all for the most part, they're, they're going to be destroyed and taken out, right? But then as, as we saw in the previous video, Commandy had basically gone to like all these different universes, or at least he'd only gone to the to the Justice League Beyond universe and then like grab those superheroes only for us to find out he's gone through all the universes that are basically being held captive by Brainiac, which includes like the Kingdom Come universe and the Superman Red Sun universe and like all these different universes that are out there and all these superheroes from across the multiverse all band together. It's pretty huge in scope. And so at the, at the same time that's going on, of course, then you have the fight between Hot Girl and Lex Luthor uh, in the present day, but essentially at the far edge of the universe uh, where all things are getting ready to break loose, right? All, all havoc is getting ready to pop off. Now, ultimately, because of the fact that Hot Girl is tied into the totality, meaning her power is necessary for Starman to achieve his goal, which is to say opening portals across like all these different time streams. So all these superheroes, once they basically grab their shards of the totality, can jump through and then all end up in this singular location to basically unite the totality and face off against Perpetua uh, that they can succeed and then ultimately end up defeating her. And it's kind of crazy because like it looks like it's about to work, right? Like like Hawkgirl ends up intending to attack Lex Luthor and then like the portals seem to start opening up and like it's their chance to win, right? Like it's literally a scene out of like Avengers Endgame, right? Where it's just like all the portals start opening and like one of the most epic scenes ever in like movie history. Like it's just, it's like one of the one of the coolest things ever. It looks like they're all going to win. And that's literally it. Like they, they grab the little shards of the totality. People start getting through as fast as they can. The problem with this is Hawkgirl. Because remember, Hawkgirl's on a quest for vengeance. And that's the problem because you had, you basically had Martian Manhunter who was absorbed and then quote unquote killed by Lex Luthor. And that's how Lex Luthor is in his current, his current form. That's why he looks the way he does uh, because he's basically the alpha predator. He's what people were in the universe before Martians and human beings were split in half and then went off to go do their own things, right? Martians and human beings used to be singular organisms. And so as a result of that, she actually ends up sidetracking from the mission and then trying to destroy Lex Luthor when she believes he's not paying any attention. But then ultimately, you know, where she kind of says, okay, fine, I'll stand off. I'll go, go play my role. He basically stabs her. And the moment when they need her power, it's not there. And so the result is that all these portals basically start closing off again. And the ability for all these superheroes to unite in a singular location, combined with basically all these humans and all these various forces across the multiverse, really kind of siding with doom, right? Basically kind of giving up on justice, things like that. And basically saying like, we side with doom. We side with the destruction of all things, essentially leads to Perpetua rising to her quote unquote final form, if that makes any sense. One of the other things that she also does is we had basically seen, remember the, the Monitor Brothers, the Forger of Worlds, the Monitor, and then the, uh, the Anti-Monitor merging into the Ultra Monitor. This in turn basically allows Perpetua to transform the three of them, allow the Anti-Monitor's personality to take hold and then restore him to his full totality, essentially giving us the Anti-Monitor from Crisis on Infinite Earths. And this is a really, really cool moment here, right? Because we get the kind of a return of a classic character. But the big takeaway from all this and the reason why this matters is because what this basically means is that with the death of Will Payton, Starman, who's killed by Perpetua and nobody really there to kind of open these portals and, and bring everybody to this singular location, essentially all hope is basically lost, right? And even among the various superheroes themselves, this feeling of hopelessness almost kind of seems to resonate, right? Like the sigil of Perpetua basically starts to emanate across all these different worlds across the main, uh, the main DC universe. Not only that, it's not just the main DC universe, it's everywhere across all realities in the entirety of the multiverse. So the ghost sector out there where you have like Darkseid and the Justice League Odyssey team, uh, where you basically have like the, the 
Polaris system with the Thanagarians. You've got the the Owens, right? The the Guardians of the Universe who were just kind of like, okay, so like we need to recall all the all the Lanterns because we can't let Oa fall. In the Dark Multiverse, where you still got Barbados chained up because he's still alive, he sees the whole sigil unfold. The Crime Syndicate of America in Earth Three, the Ori of Worlds, basically the the Multiversal Justice League team, and then you've even got the Gotham by Gaslight universe, which is which is actually one of the first universes to fall, right? Perpetua shows up and says like, side with me, right? Like side with Doom or be destroyed. And of course, because it's led by Batman and so on and so forth, they side with Justice and Perpetua wipes out the universe. She's just like, done. You guys are you guys are all gone. You guys are all, that, that's basically it for all of you. Now, the crazy thing about this is that with this universe essentially being destroyed, there's really no hope for them, right? Like, again, it's just the ending of things. That's really how it looks. It's like, there's no real chance for any of these people to come out on top for any of these guys to win. And so with that in mind, what you end up having is Hawkgirl uh, with her son Shane basically realizing the mistake they made that they essentially doomed or at least Hawkgirl doomed the multiverse so in turn trying to fly back through a portal trying to get back to everybody else being recalled by Batman and then of course Perpetua basically damages the ship just kind of leaves it derelict and, and floating in space with no real indication that Hawkgirl or her son are going to be saved by anybody like it really is just kind of the fall of everything and that's what's so good about this right is because you feel the gravity of this situation like for for this fleeting moment the, the heroes of Earth had a chance to win but in this fleeting moment one of them makes a poor decision and it all comes crashing down, right? This house of cards all comes down and it all ends up collapsing. And so what ends up happening is Batman, uh, Batman, Wonder Woman and Superman basically end up trying to see where they can to sort of, uh, sort of spy on Perpetua. And when they do, what they end up seeing is a couple different things going on. Essentially Lex Luthor and the Legion of Doom are, are kind of brought before Perpetua and she tells each of them like, you all have a purpose to serve, right? And so like they start making these demands, you know, these different things like that. Brainiac, for example, requests like a repository of, of like all of history, right? He wants to know everything that's ever happened in the entirety of the multiverse, not just the universe, but like the entirety of the multiverse. Gorilla Grodd wants basically like seven planets to control for himself, you know, and it's kind of crazy because what she does is she tells like, she tells them all, you all have a, have a role to serve, you know, and we'll start with Brainiac and she turns Brainiac into a chair. She turns him into furniture, man. That dude, that's messed up. <laughs> she literally just turns him into a throne. And, and this is, this is kind of the crazy thing is because as this is going down, this kind of human side, right? You know, Lex Luthor starts to feel this very human chill and it's just kind of like, but this is not how it's supposed to go though like it feels like she's betraying all of us and in reality that's what was always going to happen and that's what was always warned of lex luther do not side with perpetua because she'll turn against you and she'll use you for her own ends right like if you are surviving your endeavors with her it's because you're serving a purpose she wants you to serve but what happens when your purpose is done well then there's no need for you anymore and so as a result of that that's exactly what happens sinestro gorilla grod cheetah is taken they're all basically confined to these kind of vessels of sorts and and literally lex luther is watching all of this unfold and it's just kind of like what in the world is going on only for us to find out all the various powers they possess the life force the still force all these various forces really the, the if you guys remember the flash stories the forces that escaped this uh escape the the breaking of the source wall they are all basically being channeled directly into lex luther and so as a result of that it does give him a huge amount of power and this human element this this feeling that he and his team are being betrayed immediately goes away and now it's just kind of like dude this is a whole this is a whole other beast because he's basically been spared here and so in response to this the justice league kind of seeing this unfold actually changes their tune and one of the smartest ways. What they end up doing is basically looking at this and saying, okay, given the power of Lex Luthor right now, we can't really defeat him head on, right? We can't really just like get into a knockdown, drag out fight with him and defeat him because he can basically incapacitate us in any number of ways. The guy is a Swiss army knife of powers, right? He's a one man army. So if we try to go against him, he's going to crush us all. Instead, we have to fight him in a way that he would normally never expect. We can't fight Lex Luthor as if he's Lex Luthor in his battle armor facing off against Superman. We have to fight Lex Luthor as he is now. We have to reach that human side of him. We have to reach that part of him that basically we can we can sort of pull to the forefront and get him to understand what's really going on here. It's like a meta battle, right? Like an emotional battle. And it's kind of a cool thing because Batman basically gets on board as well as all the various other superheroes because it's the best plan they got. <laughs> Who's going to say no to this? And so of course the anti-monitor is basically sent out uh to destroy uh to destroy Hawkgirl and the and the ship that they're on. And then in turn the Flash basically tells Jon Stewart, "Hey, here's this car. Get in this car like right out there, you know, it's the only thing that'll help you survive out there. It'll get you out there as fast as possible." Uh, almost immediately to where they are and then save them, right? Because when you're talking about that far out in space, it would take Jon Stewart days probably to get out there, you know, flying at full power. And even then he'd have to stop at different places and recharge his ring. They need them like right now. Otherwise they're going to die in their, their struggle against the anti-monitor. And it ends up being one of the coolest things because of course Lex Luthor and the Legion of Doom show up and like they're, they're Doom base, they're Doom Citadel or whatever it is. And then Batman ends up enacting this contingency that he always had, which was like the Hall of Justice rising up out of the ground and then like basically being its own variant. It's it's only kind of design of sorts of like the, the Legion of Doom ship. And it's just like, dude, how awesome is that? Like, dude, it's one of the coolest things ever, right? Like it's Jaro is like,
like, it's an awesome measure. And then Batman's like, yeah, a final awesome measure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a totally, it's a totally awesome measure, Jaro. It's gonna be lit. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read a comic where Batman says that, like, this is lit. <laughs> but what you basically end up getting here is, like, this massive battle between, like, the forces of Lex Luthor and the forces of, like, these Justice League superheroes from, like, across the multiverse, right? Because with what little portal, what little access they've had, they've been able to kind of, like, hop in and create these little, these little skiff portals that get them to where they need to go, all, com you know, all confined in the Hall of Justice. But just, like, look at this for a second, man. Like, look at this, like, full-page spread, right? Like, you've got Shazam, you've got Supergirl, you've got, like... Superman 1 million, all right? And then you have like Jay Garrick, you've got Damian Wayne, who's a boss. All these superheroes just like charging. You got Guy Gardner running, looking like a goofball. Like you've got all these, all these guys, <laughs> all of these superheroes just like hightailing it into this battle. And it's amazing, right? Because like, this is like Scott Snyder's like final, final thing with Justice League, right? Like there's nothing else after this. When he finishes Doom War, he's like, I'm done now. And he's going to put down the pen and probably go work on JSA from what, the, what he said in the interviews. But like, this is ridiculously awesome, right? And so what you have are kind of like the iconic members of the Justice League, you know, each of one representing different aspects of the various forces, trying to bond together and trying to unite this totality. But the issue is that they're just not powerful enough, right? They don't really have the necessary forces in order to do this, right? It's like a person who's colorblind trying to trying to complete a Rubik's cube. It's just not going to work, right? Because they can't see all the colors. And it's exactly the way this Justice League functions, right? I mean, they're they're capable in and of their own right, but ultimately they're not really able to assemble this totality the way they need to. And so what it does is it switches out into space with uh, with Hot Girl and with her son Shane trying to withstand. This assault of the anti-monitor and doing pretty well but then suddenly like a car horn comes out of nowhere right like the anti-monitor turns around he's like does somebody hear a car horn and what i what i'm hoping with this car horn <laughs> what i'm hoping is that like th as this portal opens and this car sounds like this horn goes off it's like dun -dun 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 -dun. like i'm really hoping that's what it sounds like but while all this goes on the impact of john stewart and the force that he wields basically ends up kind of creating and forcing the anti-monitor to disperse itself back into its three forms right so the anti-monitor the World Forger and the uh, and the monitor itself, restoring them to their normal counterparts, but also for the anti-monitor to kind of call out for help. And while you have Perpetua, who's like destroying a world, or at least in the process of destroying a world, she grabs it and just throws it at everybody, <laughs> which is pretty boss, right? Somebody that powerful just throwing a world across the cosmos, you know, with the intention of, of smashing people. But the cool thing about this is that Snyder uses it really, really well, right? The idea is that with the World Forger's hammer, he'd be able to like, you know, essentially hit things hard enough to be able to create a portal. And since he doesn't really have the power to do that, what it would do, at least this impact would be able to kind of create a space rupture, or at least a rupture in the space-time continuum enough to where it could open kind of a gateway that would allow them to pass through. And so in essence, the, the World Forger appears to sacrifice its life when this whole process goes down. But it's, it's kind of a cool moment, right? Because Jon Stewart coming in, basically saving them, and then whisking everybody away uh, is, a, is a pretty solid moment, right? I mean, literally, the World Forger is standing there like he's getting ready to batter up and just like smash this thing as it hits the world, right? So the result of this is that back on Earth, everything's basically going to pot, right? I mean, again, like all this, like, almost all the superheroes are falling. They're fighting as best they can, but they're not really capable of holding off against the various forces of uh, of the Legion of Doom. And at the same time, once Hawk Girl arrives, you know, once she shows up there with her son Shane, then they're able to harness the power of the totality and they're able to unify it. And when that happens, what it does is it basically allows them to kind of tap into and, and kind of create a counterbalance to Perpetua herself and basically create this sort of metaphysical battle of like Pope versus Doom. And so what this means is that the Justice League themselves are elevated to like a huge amount of power by being able to harness this fragment of the totality but at the same time, it's a fight that's not just them, right? It's also the various inhabitants of Earth who are out there, whether or not they're going to side with or give up on hope. And so from there, like you literally have Lex Luthor who just starts going through and dismantling all the various members of the Justice League by channeling all these various forces that are out there, right? So like the ultraviolet force, different things like that. So he takes out Jon Stewart, the Green Lantern. He takes out the Flash. Wonder Woman goes to cut him in half. He heals himself. And then he takes out Wonder Woman. You know, ultimately he ends up taking out Jaro by basically slicing him, which is kind of nuts. Like he literally like whips him and like slices him and then he goes to take out Batman he breaks his arms and legs Superman saves him you know but at the end of the day it's just kind of like all these various heroes are falling before just Lex Luthor himself as well as like all the other powers that are out there and that's why it's kind of wild is because people are kind of fluctuating back and forth between being hopeful and being hopeless hence like the battle between like justice and doom and that's why you kind of see it waxing and waning and fluctuating the way that it is in the sense that the heroes are winning then they're losing then they're winning then they're losing and then they start to sort of overtake and kind of get to the point where they basically start continuing to win and then Perpetua shows up. And when she does, all hope basically fades here. And that's kind of the crazy thing is because what you end up getting is basically Shane, right? The son of Martian Manhunter and, and Hawkgirl who steps in and says, okay, if we're going to go in here and we're going to fight Lex Luthor, then we can't
can't fight him head on. He's dismantling all of us. Let's do what we were supposed to do. Let's fight the man, right? Let's tap into the man of Lex Luthor. And that's how it seems to go down. And so ultimately what ends up going on here is Shane basically grabs the attention of Lex Luthor and then in turn enters his mind. And as soon as he does, he basically starts addressing not Lex Luthor, but Martian Manhunter who's trapped inside the mind of Lex Luthor. And it's one of the coolest things ever, right? Because remember, Lex Luthor absorbed Martian Manhunter and he was believed to have been dead. Hawkgirl's been operating under that assumption the entire time. There was no real indication he'd be able to come back. And so following that, this conversation that takes place is absolutely amazing because Martian Manhunter inside Lex Luthor seems to have kind of given up. Now, you did get these moments over the course of this of this bit of storytelling where like he would chime in occasionally to Lex Luthor and try to get him to listen, but they seemed like half-hearted measures. And seeing Martian Manhunter as a child really kind of speaking with this, this child version of himself, Shane basically says like, you're the greatest of them all, right? You're the greatest superhero of them all. They need you. You can unite the world in a way that nobody else can, right? With Perpetua being here, with her basically dominating and, and scaring the crap out of the world, people kind of siding with Doom more or less being influenced in that way. You're the only one of us who can go out there and unite the minds of all the world and get them to stand as one against Perpetua alongside all the superheroes. And so what you get here is probably one of the greatest returns of a character in the history of comic books, right? So like the whole time Hawkgirl's freaking out, right? Like the whole time Hawkgirl's freaking out. She's like, no, Shane, Shane, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And he's like, I have to. It's the only way to make this work. Somebody has to replace Martian Manhunter. You can't just yank him out, right? Like somebody has to replace him. So Shane goes in and basically takes the place of Martian Manhunter. Lex Luthor starts to kind of almost sort of have this, this like crisis, you know, it almost looks like he's breaking down. And then like Martian Manhunter emerges and he says, I am the Martian Manhunter. And now is a time for justice. Okay, so we are picking up with the conclusion of Scott Snyder's Justice League. And there's actually a character that's going to appear that I want to draw your attention to. I think it'll give us some indication as to what's going on here. Because if I'm a betting man here, I think this is how DC and Marvel's crossover event basically starts. Now, we'll kind of get through that, you know, as, you know, kind of kind of talk about that as we go through this. But what this does is it picks up in the, the immediate aftermath of the last video that we did, right? The last issue, issue number 38, where Martian Manhunter had basically returned. Now, in and of himself, Martian Manhunter wasn't really powerful enough to turn the tide of the battle, right? And we expected that. I mean, Martian Manhunter is a really, really popular character. A lot of people really, really like him, but he himself is not capable of doing that, right? Because they're facing off against Perpetua, the creator of the multiverse. And so Martian Manhunter is just like a stronger version of Superman. It's really what he is, right? At the end of the day, you compare them pound for pound. He's basically Superman, except he has telepathy, he can shapeshift, and he's afraid of fire, right? That's basically it between the, you know, the difference between the two characters. Now we know he's stronger than Superman because of the old Grant Morrison JLA comics, but at the end of the day, he's not powerful enough to turn the tide of battle on his own. What makes the Martian Manhunter important is that this war, this, this conflict against Perpetua, right? The idea of doom versus hope, which is really what this whole thing has been about uh, in terms of the, the power of doom overtaking the power of hope or vice versa, is that it's a battle over the souls of men, right? That's, that's really what it is. It's one of these things where this isn't really a conflict that Justice League can win through sheer force. It's a conflict of what side are people going to choose, right? If people decide to choose the side of the Justice League, to choose the side of justice and to walk away from doom, then ultimately Perpetua will fall. Whereas if people side with justice, of course the just, you know, Justice League and, and the heroes will essentially win. And the Martian Manhunter pleads his case to humanity, right? And basically says, it's one of these things where we are all greater than the sum of our parts. As individuals, we're not necessarily strong, right? We're capable, we can do things, but what makes us powerful, what makes all of you guys powerful is the fact that working as a cohesive unit, you can all achieve great things. It's really one of these things where where, you know, Perpetua kind of gets the upper hand on him momentarily. And it's one of the things where basically she kind of, you know, reaches out to humanity at the same time and says like, no, 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 doom is what matters. Doom is what will win, right? Like you guys cannot possibly hope to defeat me. And even tries to use Lex Luthor as a pawn, right? And says like, tell them, like tell them the truth, you know? And at the end of the day, Lex Luthor's like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. And ultimately faith and justice were winning out in this particular kind of mental conflict. And so you have these, th this kind of, you know, debate, this kind of discussion going back and forth, not really a debate, but the Martian Manhunter continuing to kind of plead his case to people. We are all capable of great things. We as superheroes, we fight because you're people worth fighting for, right? Like you are our heroes. You know, we look at you guys and we see you as our heroes. You know, you guys see us as heroes, but it's the opposite way. It's the other way around. And so where he pleads his case, he continues on over and over and over again. At the end of the day, Doom wins. That basically humanity turns its back on heroes. And it's one of these interesting things, right? Because leaving my own opinions out of this, this really is kind of a critique on society, right? It's, it's, it literally is a, a social critique that he 
humanity and you know chose individuality and it chose doom over the superheroes now the reality of this is this choice was long in coming it was something that, that ultimately would have taken place and the reason why is because when you're various members of humanity and you look at superheroes yes superheroes do good things that's true but what you see is conflict you see heroes fighting villains you see cities getting destroyed you see collateral damage you see people kind of asking the question why do we need heroes at all but the real big thing here is that people are basically reaching down and looking to their most base desires they're not really looking at what they can achieve they're looking at what they are in the here and now and that's one of the things that's kind of intriguing because it's, it's easy to paint humanity as as villains right it's easy to look at the story and to say okay the true villains of the story are people it's the average joe right it's the average individual out there who if given the choice will always choose the worst version of themselves and people do that because it's easy to do it's much much easier to just give up than it is to keep trying it's easy to say that but the reality is that when it comes to humanity that the overriding factor here the overriding thing is fear and that's ultimately what was being fed on by perpetua that's ultimately what was really being being fed on by her and the forces of doom is the fear of people that people were afraid but the funny thing about this is that when perpetua really kind of chimes in what she says is that this is all going exactly the way that it was supposed to that everything that's transpired has transpired exactly because she wanted it to she wanted the martian manhunter to plead his case to humanity she wanted all of this to take place everything that's happened has happened according to her design and she knew that ultimately humanity was going to choose Choose the side of doom and the reason why she makes this argument or at least it seems like the reason why she makes this argument is because all of this exists partially because of perpetua right per per perpetua had her version of the multiverse that existed and it took the monitor and the anti-monitor and the forger of worlds to team up and basically imprison her inside the source wall and then recreate the multiverse as it exists right now but all the inhabitants of the multiverse all the humans that exist out there are basically branched off in some form or fashion of humans or martians right every single entity that exists out there is branched off of either humans or martians because at one point in time in the the multiverse that perpetua created is that you kind of had apex predators right humans and martians were a singular entity and so when when this was kind of wiped away when they ultimately split it was wiped away and then all new life was created in this multiverse the apex predators were basically split right so every iteration of a martian you see is based off the original martians and every single human that you see is of course based off humans as they were split as they were previously apex predators and so what this means it, this kind of confuses you a little bit what this basically means is that in the eyes of Perpetua, or at least in the eyes of, you know, the way it exists now, that if humans and Martians were originally a singular being, that when they split, humans were basically the weaker side, right? And Martians were the more powerful side. And so what this meant is that humanity as a race is inherently weak. And the reason why that matters is because it shows us why it is humanity chose its baser lines in the first place, because when confronted by fear, what do people do? People panic. They usually give in to it, right? That's the social critique coming into play. The idea that when bad things happen people just want to wait until it goes away you know really crazy political environments people are just like well i'll just wait until things get better right it's just i'll stick my head in the sand and hopefully when i stick my head back up things will be okay it's the nature of people right it's the nature of human beings you usually kind of take the easy way out the lazy way out and to not really confront their own individual fears on a regular basis and so when given the option to either confront their fear and to, to push back and see what happens or to give up humanity chose to give up and it's not just humans that do that right it's every Every single race across the cosmos that's done that and that's the exact point that perpetua makes you never had a chance to win because what you're asking of humanity is too much you're asking humanity to be brave and that's something that humanity's just not really capable of doing and so what ends up happening is she basically cleanses all the superheroes of the earth right like they're all basically gone you know seemingly wipes out all of the earth superheroes takes all the various superheroes that we saw from the different timelines and sends them back to their own individual timelines and so as a result of that it's it's really kind of left to believe the idea that the justice league has been eradicated from all of existence only for us to kind of see these sort of green you know particles more or less coalescing and then the rebirth of the martian manhunter and when the martian manhunter arrives on the moon completely clad in black he reaches out with his telepathy to try to communicate with earth but he can't right he can't talk to earth anybody he's really just kind of in isolation and then he's met by the other members of the justice league and they're like we don't really know exactly what's going on but they cannot hear us the indication seems to be that they've basically been without their powers the only person with that being the case is of course hawk girl because she has physical wings but superman doesn't really seem to be able to fly green lantern uh john stewart doesn't really have his ring anymore you know it seems like none of them really have their powers or abilities superman actually tries to fly 
and just lands back down on the surface of the moon, right? So he doesn't really have his powers anymore. And it's one of these things where John Jones kind of internalizes that and says, I saw all this coming. I knew this was going to happen. I knew we were going to lose only for the group to be met with the arrival of the quintessence. Now, the quintessence is in a lot of ways a stand-in for the Sky Fathers from Marvel Comics, right? In, the, in Marvel Comics, you've got the Sky Fathers, a council of godheads, whatever you want to call them, but it's like Odin, Zeus, and all the various earthly cosmic entities, or I guess, you know, godly entities that exist out there. In DC, this is kind of a, a larger, you know, in terms of the role they play, right? Like the Phantom Stranger isn't a god people pray to, right? Shazam is not really a god that people pray to. High Father isn't a god they pray to or anything like that, but Hera is, right? You know, she's a goddess that people pray to. So it's really more of just really powerful entities. So it's not a direct, it's not a, not a lateral comparison, but it's comparable. But one of the things that I want you to kind of notice here is that you have the wizard Shazam and the wizard Shazam does not look like the new 52 version of his character. He looks totally different. He looks like the classic version. That kind of begs the question, if the quintessence is, is universal, meaning that every universe has its own version of the quintessence or appears to, then why does Shazam appear differently here? The difference, and this is where things get a little murky, is High Father, for example, is a multiversal character, right? In all the multiverse, there's only one High Father. That's why things are kind of murky for DC because their multiversal and, or, and, and universal organizational structure is not like Marvel's is, right? Marvel's, I think, is a lot more clean cut and a lot more organized and structured. DC's is just all over the damn place. So like, we have no real clue. We don't even know what the Phantom Stranger is. It's literally, he lives up to his namesake. He's just like this Phantom Stranger that no one really knows anything about. Maybe he's the presence, maybe he's not. We don't really know. <laughs> he's just the Phantom Stranger and like, he's really powerful and he can do some stuff. The Phantom Stranger explained. That's basically what that is, right? <laughs> and so because of that, the quintessence basically reveals to the Justice League that the intention of Perpetua was to actually wipe them all out. It was to destroy them and remove them. But what they've done is essentially pluck them out of reality, right? So technically they're in the universe, but they're out of phase with everything else, right? So if you were an astronaut looking at the moon, you wouldn't really see them right now, right? Because they're kind of out of phase with you. Uh, they're not really in reality. It just looks like they are. And the reason why the quintessence did this is because there's kind of this hidden truth across the multiverse that nobody seems to be aware of and nobody seems to know about, right? This truth of the multiverse that is yet to be revealed to everyone. And because of that, the Justice League are in a position to where they can go find that hidden truth and reveal it to everybody. We don't know exactly what it'll be, but we kind of get these small little things here and there. The character of Leviathan, the events of Doomsday Clock. One of the funny things about Doomsday Clock is it doesn't really look like we're given a definitive answer when Doomsday Clock takes place in relation to this. The fact that we're shown a, a panel from Doomsday Clock seems to show that like it's already happened, but like we don't really know if it's in the same universe or not. That's the confusion behind all this. We don't really know how all this kind of ties together. But with regards to the Wizard of Shazam and looking at him, I would argue that this probably takes place in a different reality. Like that's my that's my knee-jerk reaction is essentially Scott Snyder's run takes place in a different universe. I don't know, right? We're not really given a definitive answer. We're left to believe it's in the main DC universe, right? I mean, there's really been nothing to indicate that it's not in the main DC universe, but essentially a kind of doors open up, right? And a kind of statement's made by the Spectre. You guys can enter into this space and you can pursue this hidden truth but understand if you find the answer to it, that it'll change everything, right? It'll completely alter and change everything. Now, what you end up having is the Justice League racing into this kind of doorway, and we kind of have to wait and see what happens next in uh, Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder's metal. But my perception here, this is kind of my, my thought process here. We know that Marvel and DC are going to cross over. We know that Perpetua was sent by basically the judge of the worlds, right? The cosmic judges, more or less, to create, you know, the, the cosmos, to create a multiverse, and then all the universes that exist within that that multiverse. That means there are multiple multiverses out there, right? Because one of the one of the things that was established here is that Perpetua was just one of many individuals who were sent out there into this massive chasm, this massive void of whatever this space was, and then was told to create multiverses, right? So she made her multiverse, other beings made their multiverses, and Perpetua seemed to be the only one who wanted to use the, the individual she created in her multiverse to destroy the cosmic judges. My argument here, my thought process here is the one above all in Marvel Comics is kind of an equal to Perpetua, right? Like the one above all was sent by the cosmic judges to create the multiverse. And so it's there now. That's kind of how it oversees everything. I mean, that's kind of my thought process, reconciling that with the knowledge of the one above all and how its role functions within the greater Marvel landscape is going to be kind of tough to do because the one above all is so ambiguous, right? To this day, including uh, Jim Starlin's infinity finale, the one above all, I think has made 18 or 19 appearances in Marvel comics. If that it's been referenced more times, but no, not even, not even 18 or 19. I think it's in, in some form or fashion, it's made 18 or 19 appearances appearances in terms of actually showing up it's shown up like three times right that's that's the only the only time i'm aware of there was a time in the fantastic four when it appeared to the fantastic four themselves and looked like jack kirby the second time when it appeared to spider-man and then there was a third time when it told adam warlock in infinity finale that it could be the new living tribunal and then it made adam warlock in the new living tribunal those are the only three
three times I'm aware of it actually showing up, right? So the one above all is ambiguous as hell. And what better way to kind of basically establish this secret truth, this hidden truth, is that there are a slew of multiverses out there and the Marvel multiverse is one of them, than to basically say that what you have here is the one above all creating its multiverse around the same time that Perpetua created it. And basically having like all these different giant multiverse concepts crossing over with each other. I don't know, right? I'm, I'm grasping at straws here, folks. I don't really have any definitive answers. I'm just kind of spitballing and theorizing as best I can, but it's a cool idea, right? It's a cool concept. But either way, it's an interesting end, right? Because what we do is we're going to jump over, or at least when, when this ends, you go into Robert Venditti's run. As far as I'm aware, it's not going to pick up from this, right? As far as I'm aware, this whole thing right here is going to pick up with like metal from Scott Snyder and, and Greg Capullo. I don't know what Robert Venditti's run is going to look like, right? I'm kind of curious myself. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace. Okay, I want to give a shout out to Kyle B, David Joseph, Ben, John H, AJ, Matt N, Jeff R, John H, Lean and Mean, which is an awesome name, Jason C, Austin S, Austin H, Joey M, Steven Z, Austin B, Adam K, and Genosis916. Remember guys, you can send me messages and I'll run off whatever your message is at the end of the video, so long as it's nothing crazy. But if you want to put a message in there, uh, send me an email, rob at uh, robertjefferson.com. And uh, if you are one of these people who get shout outs, then I will tack it in there. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching guys. <laughs>